So, there's a new episode of Simulated Reality, and today we have a special guest, Dr. Gopi Chand, the ex CTO of Tata Sons, and he has a new exciting startup on AI. You know, it's called Myling Foundry, and we are looking forward to how the startup. Uh, goes about, uh, you know, it has some very exciting technologies and, you know, we'll let Gopi talk about it. Hi, Gopi, uh, how are you? Hi, Michelle. Fantastic. S yeah, great. Uh, you know, you've been uh, the ex CD of Tata Sons. How was the experience like, uh, if you can tell? So, I've been ex CD of Tata Sons. Before that, I was leading the G John F. L. Technology Center. Mm -hmm. uh, and prior to that, I was in the U.S. for 12 years. Yeah. Uh, so, I've been a technologist all through. Uh, specifically as a leader on technology uh, in India, it's been a fantastic uh, journey. Uh, I think we have great talent in India and the ability to give them the confidence to contribute to global problems at scale is something which I enjoyed doing. And in each one of my roles, uh, that's what I take back as uh, success, uh, the success of the team uh, in solving some really tough uh, problem for the world. Sure. So what uh, made you move, you know, from uh, from such a big conglomerate, <laughs> and then you know, having your own startup. What was the inspiration? See, many of these uh, decisions are gut decisions, right? And when we try to give uh, clear answers, sometimes we falter. Uh, but uh, really, if I look back and look at my moves uh, from uh, the U.S. to India uh, with uh, GE, and then from uh, GE to the Tata Group, and from the Tata Group to my uh, current uh, startup. Uh, these have all been driven by maybe two or three factors, but one of them definitely is how can I contribute more to the region I'm in? How can I contribute more in this particular case to India? Yeah. Uh, that's been one of the factors definitely. Sure. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about Mylan Foundry. You know, it's uh, one of these startups who is looking to transform media consumption. It is also looking to do, uh, you know, work in healthcare and even national security. So if you could just talk about you know these things, why uh, these things, why these areas? Uh Absolutely, yeah. So uh, AI has been around for a long time, right? So 1990 when I was doing my masters, uh, it was funded by NASA and we were looking at uh, signals uh, which we were producing through eddy current sensors uh, from the space shuttle main engine, the heat exchanger tubing and trying to classify those signals as being uh, from uh, good tubing or bad tubing. Right? So uh, it was a particular use case worked very well, um, but limited uh, use case uh, in a way of uh, thinking. Uh, so over the years what has happened is really the computational pow power is what has made the difference. Some algorithmic changes, so we don't anymore uh, look at uh, uh, image and say I cannot uh, train on large sets of images because the computational power required is very high. We used to extract uh, features from mm -hmm. images so that we reduce the computational power required. Today we just throw the image. Forget image, we throw videos at the uh, AI uh, technique, typically now deep learning techniques, um, and allow the uh, neural network to pick out the features. In this case, convolution neural networks uh, pick out the features. And uh, also you go as many layers as you can get benefit from rather than stick to three layers which we used to do in the past. Uh, so what this allows you to do is deal with unstructured data. Mm -hmm. What is unstructured data? Things like voice, video, vernacular and sensors. Mm -hmm. And so where we would like to differentiate is AI for unstructured data at the edge. At the edge meaning right on the phone. So it was unimaginable even a year ago to be able to do in real time AI on video on the edge, uh, a device like your phone. Today it is possible not only because of what we do, but because the hardware, the chipsets have come along and uh, are uh, advanced enough that we can do what we would like to do. Yeah, and you know in media there is like so much data that is being generated even at the edge you know, we have ODT and, you know, constant stream of data. What can we do with all of that data? You know, if you can talk about it, what value can, can be generated? What value can you tap into which is not being, you know, done right now? Yeah, so first let me talk about uh, what are the challenges, right? Um, and one of the challenges which uh, few people will talk, uh, many people will understand if spoken, is the fact that uh, let's pick video on demand and uh, OTT for uh, video on demand. 
uh, when you're doing, uh, when you're sending across video content across the network, uh, it is not apparent, but there is a carbon footprint. Okay. Today, the video on demand carbon footprint is the same as one of the countries in Europe. Well, nobody uh, talks about uh, carbon footprint of uh, this thing. I think this is one of those things absolutely. which the media doesn't cover absolutely. as often. So there is, uh, there are computers crunching numbers yeah. in some data centers. Mm -hmm. uh, there is transmission and the computation involved in that. Uh, so really, the amount of carbon generated because of video on demand globally is mm -hmm. the same as Spain. So, so one country worth of carbon footprint because of video on demand. This does not include, let's say, um, uh, video conferencing and tomorrow's entertainment in automotive. Like if you're going to have uh, transmitted entertainment in automotive, this does not include that. And also remember that today OTT is 10% of total uh, media consumed. 90% uh, is broadcast on cable. Uh, so when uh, OTT becomes 90%, straight away you're going to see a tenfold increase in the carbon footprint. So do you need to uh, transmit, let's say, an HD file mm. in order to view an HD file on the uh, device? You do not need to. With the kind of technology that we are uh, producing, you can get an HD output on the device while transmitting a lower resolution uh, file. So that's one of the values and it's got much uh, more value than just value for the OTT player mm. which is there because lower cost, value for the consumer which is there because of lower bandwidth yeah. and the value for the planet which is there because of lower uh, carbon footprint. But beyond that uh, there is a lot more which you can do which is based on the video which is taken on the device itself. Mm. So video taken on the device you can um, essentially democratize VFX. So if you uh, think about TikTok. Uh, what is what is it offering? Amongst other things, it's offering VFX, which is democratized, right? So you can do things which uh, with your videos, which previously only a movie maker uh, can do. You can do much more than what is being offered today using uh, AI. Mm. Uh, so there is value to be generated by democratizing today what is only possible in studios. Okay. So, uh, as you mentioned, you know, the energy consumption, you also have, you know, uh, worked in that uh, yes. and obviously global warming is an issue. Uh, what role AI can play, you know, in enhancing or reducing carbon footprints and maybe uh, eventually leading to better forms of energy, you know, uh, better forms of the smart grid that we have currently? Yeah, now you're expanding the yeah. question beyond uh, the media discussion. Yes. But let's talk about it. So, if you have a wind farm. Yeah. Right. Uh, in the past, the best you could do is optimize a particular wind turbine uh, for the best uh, output given mm. the uh, wind available um, and forecast and so on and so forth. Um, but we have al already, as part of GE, what we did was uh, uh, we launched uh, products which would enable you to look at the farm, at the farm level optimize. Maybe I as a wind turbine will take less wind and produce less power in the interest of three other wind turbines behind me mm. being able to do uh, better. So that kind of optimization, uh, optimization is an example of uh, how AI can uh, play a role. But beyond let's say you have a grid which is uh, part based on renewable, past, uh, part based on uh, carbon fuel mm. and there is a demand. So based on the demand how I can optimize the uh, mix of renewable versus uh, carbon uh, uh, based uh, uh, electricity. Uh, so Myling Foundry, you know, has uh, is doing a lot of work, uh, you know, with AI applications and media. If you can talk about it, you know, in a little detail of how you're going about it, you know, the specific technologies, uh, you know, in the media sector. Absolutely, it's really fun time to be a technologist and mm. fun time to be a technologist in uh, media. Uh, so, like I mentioned, uh, there have been significant advances with uh, deep neural networks. Mm. Within deep neural networks, you have to get get to be an expert in convolution neural networks mm -hmm. right so that is uh, from an algorithm standpoint it is at the heart of the change uh, which has made deep neural networks capable of what it is uh, doing today so what are convolution neural networks uh, these are a portion of the neural network which each layer is tuned to uh, be sensitive to a certain part of let's say an image or a video mm -hmm. so a video is looked upon as a series of frames so again it comes down to an image so one layer is going to be very sensitive to uh, edges, so it's looking for lines. Um, another layer is going to be looking for shapes. Another layer is going to be looking for colors. So what we are essentially doing hence um, is layer by layer abstracting the content 
of an image um, and uh, looking for uh, meaning from this uh, content yeah. uh, and that uh, meaning could be as to the visual quality of the uh, image uh, which eventually flows into a video yeah. that uh, meaning could be as to how densely packed the uh, visual is with characters uh, that uh, meaning could be how the light and shade has been used um, in the frame uh, so once we have this then we can use uh, the rest of the deep neural network to do various things one of it uh, could be that I'm going from, from low resolution to uh, high resolution uh, and uh, the other aspect could be that I'm classifying right uh, or if I'm using something called generative adversarial networks I'm not using just one deep neural network I'm using two uh, and your deep fakes you have seen videos of uh, celebrities yeah. saying things and they have never been there and never yeah. said those things that's because a deep neural network has been used in a generative adversarial network framework um, to iterate between two neural networks and produce a video which looks authentic yeah. but you can also use it for honest good purposes for example I can uh, produce a new Picasso like painting mm -hmm. uh, I can uh, take a particular character uh, and uh, have somebody enacted but I can have the celebrity uh, time saved by having this character's video morphed into that uh, celebrity's uh, face yeah. right? so there are many things that you can use it for on a video similarly you can use it on an audio yeah we talking about you know deep fakes uh, this also issue has been on the rise for the yeah. last few years uh, uh, how can it be sorted out? Is there a way where you know technology obviously <laughs> can be used uh, for the you know beneficial aspects of it? Yeah, absolutely. See, a deep fake. Uh, it is a deep fake because the human cannot tell one from the other, mm. from one from the other. But absolutely, a computer uh, and with uh, AI itself um, or other automated techniques, you can differentiate mm. between what what is a real video and a fake video. Sure, sure, and. Uh, you know, uh, the other things that uh, uh, Myelin Foundry is working is in healthcare. Yes. Right? So, what are the applications that you're looking at for these uh, advanced AI technologies, uh, you know, in the healthcare industry? Yeah. In healthcare, of course, it is about AI. Yeah. But it's also about the sensing technology. Okay. So, what we're doing in, a in a wellness, actually, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, try to uh, move uh, care from the hospitals to clinics to nurse practitioners to relatives to the individual. So what does that entail? It entails being able to detect, move from wellness or detect wellness rather than uh, diagnose illness. Mm. Uh, and how are we doing that? We are looking at uh, sensors and multiple sensors and other demographic kind of information where uh, we are listening to the cells. So we are listening to the cells whether they are well or not. And uh, based on that, um, we can tell uh, whether you will be well long term or not. Uh, so, to give you further detail, chronic inflammation is uh, systemic, low grade, uh, which means that it is throughout the body yeah. uh, and it is present in very small uh, quantities in terms of being yeah. able and to it's not present of the naked eye, I mean there are some marker cytokinins for example, and, but uh, as you say it's something which can be used. Not bad Vishal. So yeah. uh, yes, you can do a blood test and yeah. uh, get to chronic inflammation. Yeah. Uh, but a blood test is a point measurement, right? Okay. So, and chronic inflammation is gender dependent. Uh, it's dependent on the day, uh, time of the day. It is dependent on the time of the month for women. Um, it is uh, dependent on the age. Mm. Uh, so, if you do a point measurement, it's very difficult to take that and uh, say that you're well or uh, you're mm. headed towards uh, illness. But if you measure continuously in a wearable form factor, you can. Uh, uh, determine whether there's a trend which points to chronic inflammation a um, little more conclusively than doing a point measurement. Point to point the blood test will be more accurate but as a trend we will have more yeah. valuable information when we do it in a variable form factor non-invasively. So that's what uh, we are after. So looking at being able to tie non-invasive measures to blood test measures through an AI network so that when we deploy you don't need blood tests anymore it is all non-invasive. Wow that's interesting. Obviously, that's a uh, brilliant use of this technology. But how difficult is it to do it at scale? You know, we're talking about more than a billion people, possibly. Uh, what are the challenges that could be there? Obviously, India's health budget has been low. A lot of people don't have insurance. Is it difficult to do this at scale? Uh, so the um, 
way to do it at scale is bring it down to a level where um, it uh, works across the population, right? So you have to make sure that you have uh, clinical trials. When you're doing your clinical trials, you're covering the variations of the population. What are the variations? One is the age group, mm -hmm. the other is the gender, the other is the diseased people already with chronic diseases, there are healthy uh, folks. Uh, so you need to be able to make sure that your clinical trials are covering this. Once that is done, the other aspect of being able to go uh, in terms of scale is the cost, right? So you should be able to do it uh, at a cost point which is not prohibitive. Uh, and it should not require, uh, at the point of time of deployment, uh, individual interventions to be able to interpret the uh, data. Mm. So as long as you're collecting the demographic information and you're collecting the sensor information, I should be able to tell whether the person is well or not. Uh, right, so uh, the kind of work that we are doing is um, looking at the simplicity of sensing, sophistication of analysis, yeah. and hence uh, the ability to shift care, like I said, from the hospital to the individual. Yeah, let's go, uh, you know, back to uh, media that you are going to work in. Let's and also talk about a little fun. What do you think of TikTok? You know, the impact that it's having, you know, uh, among the young population. Yeah, TikTok. I think. Uh, it's the way the world will move, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, democratizing uh, creativity. Okay. So that's the way to think about it. Yeah. It's just the first uh, uh, first example of something like that. But as you go into the future, you will see it's similar to what Steve Jobs did, right? What did Steve Jobs do? If you look at an iMac, mm -hmm. uh, before that nobody thought of giving a garage band equivalent or an iMovie equivalent on yeah. a computer. Why? They said that why would people want to produce movie uh, or produce um, uh, music recording on a home computer. If they need to, they'll come to a studio. Uh, but Steve Jobs, what he did was he said that if I am interested in producing, so let's make it available to everyone and more creative people will be able to do it. The same thing is happening now, it's just further down that uh, story, mm. that creativity is being democratized. Anybody uh, who is least bit creative is using TikTok uh, yeah. to produce uh, video with special effects and VFX uh, modes, um, which just a year ago wouldn't have been possible at an individual level. Sure. And also, uh, obviously, highlights a uh, trend, technology trend, obviously, the, the edge computing part, the ODD part versus the traditional cloud part. What trend do you see, you know, in going forward, you know, in the coming years, yeah. we talk about edge computing? Yeah, so I think edge and cloud both will be there. Okay. Uh, so it's important uh, to leverage edge for what it can do. Today, cloud has been optimized, as in most people understand cloud and what can be done on cloud. Uh, however, the compute on the edge has been hardly used. Okay. The ability to leverage the compute on the edge, including the main CPU, the DSP, the GPU, uh, these are things which have hardly been tapped. And that's where, where we are actually differentiating ourselves, understanding what is possible at the edge and using its full capacity. Now, the other aspect of doing that would mean that you're using more power, mm. right? And so there is a concern about that. But uh, simultaneous uh, to our developments, uh, the chip developers are reducing the power consumed for various activities. So that's one aspect. But you yourself, from an algorithm standpoint, have to be smart as to how do you optimize the use of uh, power. Yeah, and uh, edge computing is obviously also a great uh, thing for IoT because uh, you know IoT has been there for decades, but now with edge computing, it can really you know extract the value that that probably had been lagging for years. Yeah, so I have an uh, opinion on yeah. IoT. Uh, uh, if you think about uh, industrial IoT, which has been talked about quite a bit, uh, the difficulty is that uh, industrial things have been connected forever. Yeah, right. Uh, they've been connected uh, physically. Uh, it's not wireless based and there are yeah. sensors present and all of them have been uh, connected. So the extraction of value of IoT on uh, those kinds of stationary applications has been a challenge. So as we move um, into a more connected world, more sensors deployed, the key thing for anybody to uh, figure out is what is it that they are changing? How is it that they are benefiting, let's say, a power plant? Mm -hmm. Are they reducing a boiler tube failure rate? And that's what they should uh, target. Right? Yeah. Um, and uh, when you look at m uh, things which are moving, like cars, the value is quite apparent. Now let me come back to your uh, question. The 5G is going to make the biggest difference okay. in terms of uh, IoT. 
and that's because 5G will uh, is essentially designed for IoT, uh, low latency. Yeah. So if you have to react to something you see ahead in an autonomous vehicle, uh, that low latency becomes extremely uh, critical. Yeah. Right. So uh, I think 5G is extremely uh, critical for uh, IoT. AI and the computational power that you talked about is also going to be very critical when you have to, um, uh, the, instead of sending uh, data to the cloud, you yeah. finish the job at hand right there. So if you're viewing a thermal image, let's say, uh, of a boiler, since mm -hmm. I gave you that example, to be able to look for hot spots right there, and when you detect hot spots to send an alarm, uh, is something you should be able to do right there on the device recording that uh, video rather than sending it to the cloud and collecting all of that data. So you send only data which is an alarm. Okay. Right. So those are the kinds of things which will be enhanced as we move forward. So I mean uh, 5G is obviously 5G combined with IoT can also help a lot in I think wearable devices and you know health detecting health issues, diagnosing them. But uh, there have been some concerns you know about the health impact of 5G itself you know in terms of the radiation. Do you think there is anything there? <laughs> so I'm an electromagnetics PhD. Sure. Um, I do not believe that uh, um, any of these have a health impact. Uh, because these are tested and over tested and uh, multiple times uh, by the right kind of people. Sure. Uh, one thing we all need to know is that electromagnetic uh, uh, radiation just uh, uh, if you look at it uh, from a power standpoint dissipates, it exponentially decays from the uh, source. Uh, so you are talking about very low powers when it uh, comes to communication. Mm -hmm. And that kind of uh, low powers has not been scientifically proven yeah. uh, to have any health impact. And also these are tested for uh, by the right kind of agencies globally. Sure, sure. And uh, you know, we were talking about uh, earlier about uh, the power consumption that yeah. uh, media is creating, you know, with so much data being generated. Is there a way in which technology can help reduce uh, you know, the carbon footprint and can AI be used there? We were talking about it earlier. Yeah, yeah. so one aspect of uh, AI being used is uh, actually not having to transmit large files and sure. being able to reconstruct the same uh, quality of user experience based on uh, learning from other videos, right? So people ask how can you take a video at the edge where information is already lost and uh, bring back the quality of experience. Mm -hmm. Pixel by pixel, uh, you can bring back and even enhance further the quality of experience because the uh, weights which are deployed on the edge are, have learned from uh, high quality videos uh, before. Yeah. So that's one way which uh, we briefly touched upon earlier. Mm -hmm. But AI shouldn't be looked at in isolation, right? So you need to think about AI uh, as a powerful tool in a combination. Uh, and the powerful intersection really is that of computing, uh, biology and materials. So when you talk about energy, you need to look at that intersection and look at how to do things uh, differently. Uh, for example, if you are looking at uh, hydrogen based uh, economy, uh, you can have algae uh, produce more hydrogen versus carbohydrates um, as a biological way of uh, looking at uh, you know energy in a cleaner uh, manner and use that hydrogen yeah. uh, in order to uh, produce uh, electricity. You can also uh, look at uh, tapping into renewable power or power, uh, things like hydropower uh, during the times when you don't need and you're not using that uh, hydropower mm -hmm. right? and use it at times when you need it um, and that combination of when to do what can be AI based. But also you can use AI to mix fossil fuel power and renewable power appropriately. Within a renewable plant, you can also optimize the overall plant like a wind, uh, uh, wind plant rather than optimize an individual wind turbine. So there are various uses. Uh, but we shouldn't look at AI as a one-stop shop to solve all of uh, mankind's problems. Right? Sure. So no amount of AI or no amount of technology can compensate for irresponsible human behavior. Much of our problems today, environmental, are irresponsible human behavior. People mm -hmm. who talk about abundance uh, as opposed to promoting the cause of frugality. Sure, sure. I mean, uh, you, I think you hit, hit very perfectly. Uh, there's another aspect of AI which is you know the global politics, geopolitics and then there's like this arms race or like AI race among countries you know to advance their AI capabilities and uh, there's another obviously aspect to it 
in terms of geopolitics and that's energy itself right and oil has been one of the biggest factor there and uh, do you think that there'll be a switch uh, from as you said to renewable energy away from oil because there's a lot of geopolitics involved there as well yeah so the um, energy is a very politically charged yes uh, future right uh, it is not just dependent on what is good for the earth it is dependent on what is good for certain parts of the world yeah. from an economic uh, standpoint so it is actually not a technical answer mm. um, but if you look at it holistically take all parameters into account for the next uh, 80 100 years um, you will not see fossil fuel go away that fossil fuel wow. will include oil, will include coal, it will just not uh, go away. Okay. Um, if you look at uh, particularly oil, which you have asked about, and the derivatives like diesel and uh, petrol, uh, the fact is that there is no fuel better than liquid fuel hmm. in terms of uh, ability to handle mobility requirements. Um, and also, uh, today while we are excited about the possibility of um, electric vehicles and so on, um, we need to look at it uh, more completely. Electric vehicles are drawing current. The mm -hmm. current is being produced by fossil yes. fuel in many cases. Uh, so unless you have studied uh, the complete picture and have assured that uh, your electric vehicle is less uh, environmentally impactful holistically. So one impact is to the ozone uh, hole. Um, and the other impact is to the uh, particulate matter in the cities. Sure. Uh, so in the interest of particulate matter in the cities, um, if we are totally ignoring the uh, contribution to the uh, ozone uh, layer depletion, then we are not doing a complete uh, job. Uh, and all of these are politically charged. So you need to look at it uh, properly. And yeah. uh, unless you are reducing consumption, it is quite foolhardy to, foolhardy to think that we can switch technology one way and another way, do the same amount of consumption and get away with it. Sure, sure. And obviously electric vehicles may not be coming in that large scale soon and we might still have to depend on fossil fuels for quite a while. But what do you think about automated vehicles, you know, and the, you know, the rise of robots? Do you see that happening, you know, in terms of automation? So automated vehicles in Western countries with the lane dedicated to automated vehicles, I think will happen okay. um, because it's possible to implement. And why a lane dedicated to automated vehicles? If you mix automated and uh, manual vehicles, uh, automated vehicles might be following the rules mm. uh, and expecting other vehicles to follow the rules. Uh, but that will not be the case if you have a person manually driving a vehicle uh, because the person can uh, uh, you know, be all over the place in terms mm. of the uh, rules, the skills and uh, so on. In a country like India, absolutely nowhere in the near future, yeah. you will see anything autonomous or close to autonomous and it is not even the right solution for any of our problems. The solution to our problem is public transportation. Mm. In fact, one of our guests, uh, CEO of DriveView, we had him and he also was saying the same thing that in India it's incre incredibly difficult to implement autonomous vehicles on the road. Uh, but do you see uh, that you know, uh, if so, you're saying that all the vehicles should be driven automated. Then only it can work. There has to be lanes, proper lanes, which people follow, or there should not be any people at all uh, because they're going to mess up. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So either you have a dedicated lane for autonomous vehicles, mm. because all autonomous vehicles might not mm, come about because there are people very passionate about their freedom and yeah. their ability to control. Even in con in countries like the U.S which are going to take a lead on this, there will be people who are not going to give up their ability uh, to drive because they look at it uh, on equal terms as gun control or any uh, any other such yeah. similar uh, parameter where they feel control is being taken away mm -hmm. from them. Uh, so there will be population which loves autonomous vehicles um, and uh, since this mix is not possible, hence you need the lane. Um, but also in areas where uh, pedestrian traffic uh, is uh, managed or uh, non-existent. So none of this is possible in a country like uh, India. Yeah, you talked about you know a very important point, which is individual freedom. Yeah. And uh, with the systems that are being created, you know, uh, people feel there is a lot of surveillance technology that is coming into the picture. You know, uh, I mean, I think it's inevitable. But what do you think uh, will be the implications of yeah. certain technologies? People are even concerned about like you know, a country like US is also concerned about applications like TikTok itself. Uh, mm -hmm. So what is your take on the privacy issue and the surveillance kind of thing? See, privacy and surveillance uh, are interrelated, yeah. but we'll talk about uh, both 
Um, I think GDPR did a fantastic job in mm. terms of ensuring that uh, the data privacy aspects are well thought through and India has done a fantastic job uh, quickly following uh, and making sure that uh, we are uh, leading the world again. Um, it's also more important in India than anywhere else because we have 1.3 billion people number one. Uh, we can produce a lot of uh, data number two. This data has value. The value has to accrue to the individual. The uh, data has to belong to the individual. So few things are happening, right? Uh, what do all these uh, data privacy laws look at? One is if you're using uh, individual's data, you need to inform the individual, take the consent. Mm -hmm. Second is the consent is based on certain particular use uh, of that data. If that use changes, you have to take consent again. Third is you'll have to tell the individual how long you're going to use that data for that purpose, where you're going to store that uh, data. Mm. Uh, so these are the kinds of things which I think are perfect. Uh, you should do this because um, just like anything else, this data belongs to me. It's just like my apartment which I want to rent out. Uh, so as much control I have over my apartment, I should have over my uh, data. Sure. And the laws are there right now and the thinking is uh, right in my view. Uh, so if companies are concerned about this, hard luck, you have to uh, come up to speed yeah. uh, and take care of this. Right? There is no other uh, way of doing this and this is the right way of doing it. We as a company actually deal with a lot of data and we should be concerned more about such uh, laws. But I am all in support of ensuring that uh, data ownership is with the individual and there is sufficient uh, laws to ensure that that ownership uh, is not uh, taken away. Now let's uh, come to uh, surveillance. Yes. Right? Uh, I think uh, there can be rogue kind of surveillance, there's the big brother kind of surveillance, but there is also uh, surveillance based on published expected uh, behavior. Right. So for example, um, in an airport, um, you are supposed to not do certain things and if there is a surveillance camera looking for uh, certain behavior and uh, anticipating risks. Uh, to protect the larger uh, majority of the population. I think that's fantastic. Mm. Or you're looking at, uh, let's say, satellite imagery uh, to ensure that the borders of the country are secure um, and not uh, subject to uh, terrorist uh, attack. Sure. Um, or our uh, seas are not ferrying uh, terrorists into our land, like the 2611 uh, incident. If you can look at a combination of sensing which is like satellite and also bring in automation like with AI and uh, be able to uh, reduce such in, uh, effect, impact. I think that's the right thing. Sure. Uh, we have some critics who also say, you know, giving the example of China, that it may be the government itself who wants to surveil their citizens, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. The Indian government has also been, uh, you know, asking platforms like WhatsApp <coughs> to create backdoor channels. Um, Obviously, in the name of uh, national security and you know terrorism prevention, but is that a fair call on behalf of the government, or could there be like a further clash between citizens and governments across the world? So the uh, government uh, should be a good government, right? Yeah. Uh, so you have to be able to trust the government, mm -hmm. um, and uh, if the government is a rogue government or has certain policies, they will implement uh, those uh, policies. So the uh, difficulty is not with the technology. Mm -hmm. If not AI, it will be some other technology. Sure. If you want to uh, enact surveillance, uh, there are many ways to do it. Um, so it is not about the technology, it is about the intent. Okay, got it. So, and also like you said that, you know, you wanted to add a value to the nation, that's why you know, you've been working on it. And one aspect of it is obviously national security that yeah. Malin Foundry is focusing on. You know, without naming any detail, because I know it's a sensitive topic, what, what basically is my Foundry doing for the national security? Yeah, so what we are able to do is uh, automate uh, many of the manual uh, tasks. For example, if I have a 7 kilometer by 7 kilometer satellite image, mm -hmm. and I have to box every feature which I see on that manually, which is how it is uh, done. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, it takes a lot of time. Number two, maybe it is not done completely. Um, and number three, by the time it gets done, maybe it is a little bit too late uh, to take action. So being able to automatically, using AI, uh, tag uh, all such uh, videos and images and identify threats uh, is one of the aspects that we are looking at. Sure. Just to give you a flavor. Okay. Uh, also going back to the, you know, uh, the development of certain technologies, and you were talking about material science, you know, and uh, there are certain things which 
couldn't you know come to fruition you know uh, so for example if we talk about graphene for example there was like a lot of hype you know about a decade ago on the applications of graphene and then there was talks about 3d printing but uh, you know lot not lot has happened on scale so uh, what is what is happening there if you yeah. touch upon see materials it takes 20 years for any material to come out of the lab and enter the market so um, one of the things which is happening which might help speed that up Uh, is microfluidics. Okay. Uh, so microfluidics, uh, when you're looking at uh, uh, scaled up uh, plant, um, what it allows you to do is uh, produce a new material. Number one, when you're experimenting and doing thousands of experiments, mm. it allows you to connect those experiments very quickly. Why? Because in the microfluidic channels, you're doing away with the issues of uh, mass flow rate uh, uh, delays. as well as a uh, heat delay so when you're having a reaction there is heat and when you're doing it at regular scale you have to wait for the heat to die out um, or wash it away it takes time and then uh, these are all exothermic uh, kind of reactions and then actually uh, step by step uh, go and evaluate what is your output uh, but with microfluidics uh, the heat can be washed away very easily the quantum of heat is such that uh, uh, that is not an issue the mass flow rate is also uh, addressed so both experimentation and production you are able to do a much uh, better job sure but without that technology uh, fully mature it takes 20 years to get a new material into the market so graphene indeed is a fantastic uh, material um but it sometimes get overhyped right so just think about it what is graphene uh, it is carbon based um, and it has uh, got 100 times the strength of uh, steel by Uh, weight, uh, right? So if you uh, use it like that, it looks just miraculous. But just the fact is that you cannot use graphene in multiple layers. So it is a you, typically its best use is in one layer. Uh, so the amount of property change it imparts is extremely good. Um, but it should be looked at it in that way that mm -hmm. uh, I can put a layer of graphene on steel and extend its life. um i can uh, put a layer of graphene on steel and make uh, it thinner for the purpose it is getting uh, used and it is today being used already for those uh, purposes sure uh, so when we glam sham uh, yeah. material uh, it doesn't live up to the expectations because it had been looked at at a very superficial level uh, the applications which actually it is useful for will be only so many sure and how can ai help in this regard you know in finding better applications could ai expedite uh, absolutely know, this thing yeah so we did some work uh, with uh, harvard and uh, uh, continuation of that work uh, uh, is critical globally and we are looking at some opportunities in india as well mm -hmm. uh, but what you are thinking what we are thinking about is a combination of uh, the microfluidics which i talked about so if you have thousand experiments to do microfluidics can do it quickly but how about reducing it even further by picking the right experiments using ai so once i do a round of experiments based on the output i can use ai to tell what should be the next set of experiments rather than serial or uh, serial order doing all the experiments i can hit my product let's say a drug discovery much quicker using combination of ai and microfluidics sure uh Let's go back to healthcare again. <laughs> sure. Is it something that you're looking at for so, uh, myelin foundry? So for myelin foundry right now, the fo I'll tell you how the focus has come about. Uh, so if you look at um, healthcare, mm -hmm. one aspect of healthcare would be to find the disease. Okay. Right. So you can use a CT or an MR to find a tumor. Sure. Right. Or you can find uh, infarction uh, if you've had a stroke. Um, so that means that uh, an issue has already occurred. right or you can use an ecg to look for deviations uh, from what is uh, good or you can is use an ecg to detect a heart attack so that's one uh, zone and much of our imaging technologies are in that zone of finding disease finding where the disease is and how to intervene and mm -hmm. while intervening also you can use a biplane um, x-ray uh, to look at if you're placing a stent Uh, where you're placing it, and if you're removing the blockage and so on and so forth, wonderful technology, and you'll continue to need that. Um, as a startup, we didn't want to play in that uh, space. It's a uh, field where big players have to play. They have the right kind of R and D resources. They've been working on it for big you know, decades. Big players like Google, maybe. Because Google, Google, if you if you look at the Google uh, steps that they have taken recently, you know, with their acquisition of Fitbit and you know, using a lot of health data, do you think they are moving in that direction? They are they are in the different direction, which I'll come to. Okay, sure. I'm talking about big players like GE and Philips okay. still. 
Like, okay. uh, for example, to make an MR magnet, there are only two places you can make uh, MR magnet. So, mm. it's not like everybody can come suddenly into the field and create an MR machine. Uh, the MR machine is very complicated. Just imagine uh, how it works. You know, you're putting an hydrogen atom into a spin. Uh, using a combination of uh, steady state magnetic field and an RF magnetic field. You are using a gradient magnetic field to detect where that hydrogen atom is spinning and based on that you are reconstructing uh, the tissue uh, which it belongs. This is just, you know, even as an electromagnetics guy, I just find it very hard to believe. So mathematically, uh, the kind of research which has made it uh, possible is amazing. So it is not possible even of the Googles of the world to come and be more competitive in this area. What hence they are playing a role is in activity tracking, uh, right? So the, all the things that you are seeing Fitbits and all of them do is either activity tracking or little better than uh, activity tracking. The way we are thinking about it is, okay, there are people who are really good at healthcare. Um, there are people who are getting good at genomics, uh, which is looking at your DNA and saying, are you susceptible to certain kinds mm. of diseases? There are people who are doing great research on microbiomics. Uh, which is looking at the bacterial constitution on your body, be it your skin, be it your gut and various other cavities and saying uh, has uh, your life uh, led to the right state of the bacteria and these are good bacteria, right? Uh, we are looking at it at another level for one reason which is um, right now as a startup to be able to do microbiomics, to be able to do genomics uh, is going to be really expensive. Mm. The kind of equipment that you need, it's not that we don't have ideas, yeah. but the kind of equipment that you need is going to be um, uh, expensive. So we are going after listening to the cells, right? That is another way and uh, we believe it's adding use. None of these are uh, going to solve the problem by itself. So we are looking at listening to the cells and saying as soon as you move away from wellness, we can start telling you that uh, you know either you are not getting enough activity, you are not getting enough sunlight, or you are eating wrong mm. um, or you are stressing out. Uh, these are all things which uh, are part of uh, the life today uh, and uh, to be able to uh, give you advance notice that you might want to watch out is what we are going after. Sure, sure and you said uh, the money part. So what about the funding for Milan Foundry? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know, Milan Foundry raised one million dollars recently. Yes. Yeah. So if you can talk about, you know, if you're looking to, you know, raise further funds. No, we will be. Uh, we believe that we'll need uh, more funds to sure. be infused in the May June uh, time frame. Okay. And I think we've made uh, significant progress since even the last uh, funding round. Mm -hmm. um, and we will be having uh, uh, POCs with our media and entertainment customers. Sure. Uh, up and running. Um, and also we have revenues uh, coming from the security part like we uh, discussed. The wellness part is long term, uh, mm -hmm. but we would have done clinical trials and shown uh, the viability of what we are uh, trying to do and patented that uh, technology. Uh, so I think uh, uh, we hope, I should say, that people will be excited about sure. what we are doing and want to be part of it. Definitely. Talking about healthcare again, I mean, there is uh, obviously this trend of gene editing, you know, with what CRISPR yeah. and all that. What is your uh, take on that? Is it, is it something that will take up? I mean, there are obviously a lot of ethical issues involved here. Yeah, see, um, uh, if you look at uh, the existence of humans on the earth, mm. um, it is uh, going to uh, cause a stress on the earth. So, yeah, various stages of gene editing, genetic modifications, uh, which we need to uh, talk about. Um, one example would be, uh, let's start with genetic uh, modification. Mm. Right? So, if you have a plant uh, um, or if you have a crop and you want to protect it against pesticides, Right, uh, you want to produce a certain quantity of crop. Let's start there, and uh, hence you want to hence you want to protect it against uh, pesticides. Uh, so what uh, do you do? You either use uh, pesticide, so you sure. want to protect it against pests, so you use pesticide, or you can genetically modify it and make mm. it resistant to the pest. Uh, so when we are against uh, genetic modification, you need to consider that one way or the other, you are going to impact the environment. Mm. Uh, so, if you use uh, pesticide, uh, you are going to impact the environment. If you use genetic modification, we do not know what kind of impact it is. Uh, and uh, the laws require that you do all the experiments to, to ensure that there is no impact. But there might be some future impact that you are not anticipating. But laws will require that when that is found that you take appropriate uh, steps. So, using technology to continue to live on this planet the way we are doing uh, is a given thing. right? So. 
so when it comes to gene editing on crop or genetic modification on crop, I think that it is a necessity. It will become a necessity to support the kind of uh, population that we have on the uh, planet. Mm. Now, when it comes to gene editing of uh, humans, humans. Yeah. Um, it is much more controversial. So, I can only give you a personal uh, opinion. Mm. I think um, the diversity of human population, the variation that uh, we have, the differences in talent, somebody is talented at X, somebody else is talented in Y, um, the differences in health, the differences in uh, uh, various aspects of our existence, um, the thinking, these are all what make us a fantastic uh, species and I think we have to preserve that. Uh, so I am uh, not as a technologist but even as a human being, I believe that we have to be extremely careful when we talk about uh, ed editing the human uh, gene. Hmm. But probably China is going to do it anyway. So, <laughs> so uh, there's one more aspect of media and that's intellectual property rights, you know, uh, it's something that for example, let's say the example of music industry or film industry. You know, the piracy is still rampant and it has always been. And there has been like talks about it that actually it's the technology which actually harmed the industry. Uh, do you think that uh, AI or probably something like blockchain can help uh, enhance intellectual property? Say if there's a musician, you can assure him that his song will not be just distributed across the web free of cost. Could technology help in that? Yes, see, technology can be used in any which yeah. way. So one of the uh, ways it can be used in a negative way is like you said, uh, when digitalization happened mm -hmm. uh, and music was uh, uh, available in a digital format as yeah. opposed to a tape, uh, you could uh, distribute it and uh, there were issues uh, yeah. which were uh, created. Today it's less of an issue, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when you're using the video sharing uh, platforms or uh, music uh, sharing uh, platforms, it is not possible to uh, download it at the quality uh, that you would like it to uh, play mm -hmm. uh, easily, right? So sure. uh, still there are workarounds, there are people who will hack and you will be able to get through and uh, use that particular video or use that particular uh, audio. Uh, and I believe that uh, you can produce technology to be beat that, counter that, but there will be technology which will be produced which will even further beat it or counter it. So this is a cycle which will continue. However, I think that uh, the benefit of uh, the technology should far supersede um, and uh, the quality that you can provide with authentic video and authentic audio should be so superior that nobody will want even to deal with a pirated copy. Mm. Sure. So sure. as an example, if I can make hardware such that uh, unless it sees certain keys, it will not even play that file. So we can uh, ensure that on the right kind of hardware. Um, your uh, pirated copies will not play. But of course it will play on some other hardware which are also meant for pirated stuff. Yeah, again then, China. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, I wouldn't pick on a particular country in uh, that way. <laughs> no, I was yeah. just joking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, China has obviously contributed to a lot for the global economy, both in terms of innovation as well as stealing stuff. So. <laughs> um, Let's you, you mentioned that you know Milan Foundry has acquired a patent um, and obviously it's doing uh, great research work. If you can touch upon you know uh, the research work that uh, Milan Foundry is involved in. So one part of it is the wellness side which mm -hmm. I uh, spoke about. Uh, so that's going to be long term. Sure. So the clinical research that we're doing there starts off with um, a set of a cohort of 25 individuals who we tracked for uh, two weeks um, and we are doing both uh, the non-invasive measures like uh, heart rate variability and uh, bioimpedance mm -hmm. and all their demographic information and even if they were uh, stressed on that particular day and things of that kind and doing their blood tests. Sure. Right. So uh, and doing it for 14 uh, days gives us certain limited amount of data um, but that hel helps us identify whether we are in the right direction. So next we'll go to 200, next we'll go to 2000 in terms of the cohort, cohort that we will use to uh, continue to build our uh, data. Um, mm -hmm. And that data will in turn, it's got enough variability uh, that we will need to use AI to be able to translate the non-invasives that we are getting into predicted values of the uh, blood test. Mm -hmm. uh, but really we are not interested in telling you what the outcome of the blood test is. We are uh, interested in telling you that uh, there is a prediction of chronic inflammation and that there is a prediction of wellness. Mm -hmm. right? So that's what uh, we are after. So that's going to take three years of 
uh, work, research, and hence we are a deep tech uh, company. Sure. Uh, but also in media and entertainment, there are many uh, things that uh, we are looking at. For example, um, we would love to uh, use AI uh, to automatically produce uh, music, to automatically uh, enhance uh, lyrics, uh, and uh, do certain things which are creative, uh, and um, today which only humans can do. Hmm. Uh, so I'll tell you why it is that this is a tough challenge. Uh, so with um, AI, today you can interpolate. So if I train it on a set of Picasso paintings, like I said, generative adversarial networks can uh, start off with noise and produce a Picasso-like painting. But can it produce a new artist? It cannot because it's not been trained and uh, there is no method of doing it in that manner. But if I use random noise and if I use random ways to jolt it out of a trained uh, zone into a new space, um, I can attempt to create a new artist. So that is pure research, right? So we would like to create new AI artists whose uh, style is entirely uh, new. But where is the human going to come into it to listen and say, okay, this music actually sounds good or this uh, way of looking at a video sounds good. So the human is still there to accept or reject uh, a piece of art and that human better be a real good artist uh, himself or herself. But that's another area that uh, we are, uh, you know, per, uh, c anything creative using AI is something that we are pursuing. Well, a lot of, lot of people say that, you know, uh, the creative element of uh, the humans may not be replaced. Do you believe that is true or AI is going to just take over both in terms <laughs> of you know, the technical aspects as well as the creative aspects? Yeah, see, the, uh, let's look at creativity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, creativity in a simple way is saying that anything new, if you produce anything new, it's creative. Sure. Whether it has value or not, if it is new, it is uh, creative. So there are many ways to do this. One is um, to combine. So there are two things. Uh, which are already existent, but you combine it in a new way that is mm -hmm. also uh, creative. Uh, there, you can also be transformational, which is uh, you are in an age of, uh, let's say, impressionist paintings, and you uh, produce a new type of cubism uh, or modern art, and so you are transforming the entire world of art, and that is another way of uh, creativity. So you need to look at the spectrum and say, where is it that you are saying that machines can't uh, play a role? Today, if I have to combine stuff, and produce something new. Machines can do it far better than humans because I can combine really millions of stuff but I'll allow the human to interpret which is a good piece of art, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. Right? Um, if I want to do something transformational which is not in the data set. It's also very subjective, you know, it may also differ from human to human. A painting may look different to me, you know, from what you perceive it. So it's a lot of like abstract art which they say, you know. So do you think that AI can actually uh, explain how it came up with or it can recognize, you know, the beauty of a painting itself or is it just, you know, mishmashing things yeah. and coming up with yeah. things and like you hit upon the most important thing, right? Yeah. Emotion is not something that AI has nor will it have because uh, what you can do is program emotion. Hmm. But when you program emotion, it's not emotion, right? Because emotion is spontaneous hmm. uh, and that spontaneity will not be present. You have to program uh, the machine. Uh, and so under a certain situation, if you program it to produce a certain kind of emotion, that by definition is not uh, emotion. Yeah. So you are right, creativity, uh, the value of creativity is emotional. Mm. Right? Uh, however, there are very clearly uh, people who uh, are able to judge uh, you know, a certain piece of art. Um, and uh, uh, it is like wine. Mm -hmm. uh, just because somebody didn't like wine, it doesn't mean the wine is uh, not good because you have to develop a taste for it. But there are uh, people who are accepted as people who understand art and who can critique art and uh, you know, there is a and value they, to And they can help train those AI models to judge paintings maybe? I don't believe so. Yeah. I think it is still emotional. Still emotional. I think it is still emotional and okay. emotion is the last frontier mm -hmm. for the humans. Sure, that's the last... Uh, I think that's eventually that's the hope, <laughs> right? You know, with so much happening in technology, uh, what kind of business models do you see emerging in the coming years? You know, uh, obviously, as you said, it's a great time to be technologist, and there's like a, this merge merge of technology and business. Uh, you know, at this point of time. Yeah. See, one of the things which is always going to continue, and 
No matter what anybody says, you have to look out for it as unit economics. Okay. So if it doesn't work for a unit, it's not going to work at scale. Mm. Just because for transistors it worked, you cannot say that about everything that once I scale up it will work. I'm loss making on a unit, but I will uh, when it is uh, so many units, it will be uh, profitable. I think uh, that uh, situation has to change, that has to go back to classic unit uh, economics, that sure. uh, thinking in my uh, view. So the uh, models have already shifted, right? So the uh, B2B and B2C are to be looked at uh, differently. Um, so uh, uh, the la one of the things which we need to be cognizant is the end of capitalism. End of capitalism. Yeah, in a particular way. Uh, so uh, previously, if you wanted to start a company, uh, you needed to have significant amount of uh, capital. Mm -hmm. Right? Today, you don't need to. Uh, today, if you're a startup, uh, uh, you can get heavy-duty computing on, let's say, Amazon Web Services or Microsoft or wherever it is. Mm -hmm. And also, you can get credits for that uh, from the respective players because they want to be part of the sure. startup ecosystem. Um, and so, the capital economy where you needed that huge amount of capital to start off uh, is no longer there. So, mm -hmm. uh, it is micro-capitalism, let's uh, call it. Um, so there is a shift in um, how business is done in terms of the ecosystem of uh, large companies, small companies and uh, so on. In terms of uh, uh, consumers and consumers uh, paying for what they consume, uh, the models might uh, vary in the short term but at the end of it uh, you need to come back to either an advertisement based model or a subscriber based model or a transactional based model. Mm. I think that we need to keep this very uh, clear. Okay, uh, and you know, for Mylan Foundry, what is the focus? Is it B two C or B two B? We are B two B. B two B. Yeah. Okay, uh, and is there any specific reason? Reason for that? Yeah. So it's easier today to be B two B in the area that we are in. So mm. we can deal with one OTT company, okay. as opposed to having to deal with uh, uh, you know millions of individuals mm. uh, where we do not have a name recognition. Sure. And you know, uh, for B2C businesses, there's like a lot of hype. If you look at, you know, especially they get all the focus from the media. Why do you think that is? Why? Because possibly, you know, B2B may be more profitable because yeah. a lot of the B2C companies may not be making as much money. We saw what happened with, you know, certain businesses who have probably, uh, you know, have not been profitable in fact, but they had a lot of hype. Yeah. Right? So B2C, the hype is there because they're more visible. Okay. So their names are in front of consumers all the time. Sure. Um, so be it a cycle sharing company. Uh, or uh, be it an uh, airline company, uh, the fact that uh, your name is in front of the consumer, the mind share is already uh, there. Um, so anything which happens to those uh, companies, positive or negative, immediately is in front of millions of people. Sure. And uh, since it's millions and billions of people even, the hype exists. Sure. And you know, in 2018, we saw a huge, huge crowdfunding and business model where people were raising money on the Ethereum blockchain using you know, uh, token offerings and uh, what do you think about that? I mean obviously there's a huge uh, unregulated aspect to it but people were interested, people were funding a lot of companies who were involved specifically in blockchain and also in other companies as well, AI included, where they had just you know released their equity, I wouldn't call it equity, they didn't call it equity because you know there's a huge mm -hmm. uh, regulated aspect to it, but they call it that you share the network and the token represents a piece of the network. Yeah. So do you see that these, this kind of a model where people are crowdfunding things on an unregulated platform, which may obviously get regulated later on, but do you see that sticking? Thing? So depending on the size of it, if it's something small, yeah, uh, something niche, I think it will continue and it will grow. Yeah. Uh, but if it is something big and you do not want to be dealing with millions of people for something big, you want two or three strong players to put little amount of money yeah. and that's how it's going to work. Yeah, but if you look at blockchain in general, what do you think are the applications? Obviously, there is a huge aspect of financial application there, right, where you can tokenize a lot of things. Uh, but what do you think is the you know, implication of the blockchain revolution in the last three, four years? Yeah, see, the place where you'll see blockchain uh, really successful um, is in security. Okay. Right? Uh, so the ability to uh, do cryptography okay. um, and um, secure uh, assets uh, are going to be much more enhanced by blockchain and blockchain-like uh, technology. Mm. And we need to be cognizant about what blockchain offers and what it needs. Uh, for it to be successful, yeah. you need to have uh, logic 
for having a decentralized ledgers, which yes. means decentralized authority. So yes. if a decentralized authority is acceptable, let's say that I'm a large company and I have my sourcing team and we are having uh, uh, many vendors and if I'm going to be looking at blockchain, whereas I'm accepted central authority, I'm the one paying for everything, um, there's no need for blockchain. I've seen many people running around trying to do this kind of job mm. using blockchain. Yeah. But why? Uh, why use blockchain when you are the central authority figure anyway? Yeah. Right? If people say that there is in increased transparency and increased security, it is not true. Okay. Uh, you can create that kind of uh, transpar transparency and security many other ways. Yeah. Right? Where does it hence uh, play a role? Let's say that we are a group of fishermen and um, we uh, want to uh, work together. We are all peers. We want to work together and export fish to let's say Japan. And Japan needs to know the source of the fish, where exactly it came, what date it came and so on. And I want to create this ecosystem and uh, there is no central authority uh, here in mm. India who is producing the fish, nor there is a central authority, not one person buying yeah. in uh, Japan. There, uh, blockchain kind of a network uh, helps a lot because nobody wants somebody to manipulate sure. uh, this data yeah. and they don't want that central authority figure yeah. uh, because there isn't one. Right? Mm -hmm. So you need to find those applications where uh, such situations exist. Yes, uh, so you touched upon a very important thing, I mean decentralization and uh, central authorities like governments and central banks for example. Do you think that uh, it could be like an existential maybe threat to them? Could it be? So the uh, government will not most likely accept uh, a currency which is not controlled yeah. by the government. Sure. I think one of the roles of the government is to control the currency, right? So not it's not a technology issue, mm. it is a control issue. Okay. And uh, definitely currency is one of the things which the government will uh, want a say over. Yeah, yeah. But there could be uh, some business models that do not involve uh, currency, right? Uh, and uh, if you talk about the Indian aspect, right, you know, a lot of startups are doing a lot of innovation. Uh, what are the trends do you see in the Indian startup ecosystem? Obviously, there's a lot of money flowing into uh, funding the startups and you know the different technologies they're playing with. Yeah. No, the uh, Indian startup system is fast maturing, right? So a few mm -hmm. years back, you would be hard pressed to find startups which are not hyped up for no good reason. Sure. Um, so a lot of money was flowing in easily and uh, uh, you see remnants of that still. Uh, companies which do not have a business model, yeah. which do not have unit economics, which will never have unit economics. But right now you are seeing the more mature startups, even from uh, people just graduating, right? Even uh, I'm teaching at IIT Hyderabad. And as part of that, I come across uh, many students uh, with uh, startup um, ideas. And of course, I tell them that ideas are not as important as the team. Right? Yeah. So they also have fantastic uh, teams, diverse teams, working on the right problems, uh, deep problems, requiring good amount of work, rather than this idea, uh, which I want to take to the billion dollar uh, valuation. Mm -hmm. So I think we are fast uh, evolving. Uh, Indian uh, startup ecosystem, uh, uh, for it to reach uh, maturity of the um, Silicon Valley or Israel kind of maturity, I believe is five years away. Okay, but well, it is coming. It is coming. It is coming and fast uh, coming. And then what could be the impact of that? Obviously, on the Indian, uh, you know, on, on let's talk about poverty, for example. You know, mm -hmm. India is still a poor country. In the, what could be the impact of that innovation? Will it trickle down to the you know poor populations? That's a tough problem to solve with mm. startups alone. Uh, yeah. What uh, if you think about lifestyle mm. and creating a adequate lifestyle for our citizens, you have to create 100 million jobs in the next 10 years. Mm. Startups will not be able to create 100 million jobs in the next 10 years, right? but it will be a significant part of that uh, solution. Sure. So, so you're saying that the onus is obviously on the regulators and the government right, to create these jobs? The government should get out of the way, yes. is how I would put yeah. it. Their regulation should be thoughtful and reduced. Mm. This is what the current government is attempting to do as well, so I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, really, um, uh, if we as citizens are allowed to be the best we can be, I think that's what is required. Sure. 
uh, and let's talk also about the related, you know, skill aspect of it. You know, with the technology changing so fast, and so is a need for new skills. And so, you know, our audience really, uh, obviously, would appreciate that because there are a lot of people who are trying to listen to us and read our stories to understand, you know, the new skills of the yeah. age. So, if you could talk about that, you know, what would be your advice uh, for youngsters? Yeah. So, uh, one aspect of uh, the advice would be to uh, youngsters who are graduating right, with degrees. Mm -hmm. And the uh, thing that uh, we look for when we are hiring is really curiosity and confidence. Okay. Uh, nobody is expecting that what you learned in college will be the only thing that you uh, use at work. So you need to be a constant uh, learner. And you need to have the confidence to say, I do not know, but I can figure it out, I will learn. Right? That is, uh, from a soft skill standpoint, the ability to uh, say that I know and I don't know and be able to learn what you don't know mm. uh, is something that we need to uh, get our uh, talent to be more uh, cognizant about. But let me come down to uh, engineering aspects and sure. then we'll go broader. Uh, from an engineering standpoint, I look at it in three areas. Right? So engineering fundamentals, um, engineering mindset and engineering execution. What are the skill sets uh, required? Engineering fundamentals, you need the theoretical fundamentals, which we are very good at in India. We also need hands-on fundamentals, which we are very poor at in India. What do you, what do you mean uh, by hands-on fundamentals? Hands-on meaning if you are an engineer, you better know how to use your hands to build something. Okay. We do not test for it when we are admitting students. We do not train for it adequately in the college. So I think that has to uh, mm. improve. Okay. Uh, then the engineering mindset. I can uh, find enough people who do very well on component level, uh, but extremely poor we are at imparting system level uh, skills. Yeah, you also, uh, I think, need to elaborate on that system. Yeah, yeah. so system is, uh, if I'm looking at, let's say, an aircraft engine uh, blade, mm. uh, so I can get very good at the blade, yeah. um, but as a, a country will only progress if I also understand where does the blade fit in uh, and where does the engine fit in, uh, who buys these engines, how they are sold. So not only the engineering system, but the human system, mm. the everything. Okay. That you need that curiosity okay. uh, to go broad. Because as a career, you are building uh, not just as a fan blade engineer, you are going to build into something larger. Right? Okay. So that system level thinking is uh, uh, not adequately put. The system level thinking, if it is there, then you will become a good systems engineer. Yeah. I complete. The third one is execution, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Execution we are great at when mm -hmm. it comes to cost, and you know, ISRO is a great example, right? Uh, uh, also, quality, uh, I think we are good at given the right kind of guidance. But the place where we falter, and that's where we do not continuously improve, is documentation. Mm -hmm. We do not document anything. As engineering uh, skill, one of the skills which is essential and we do not impart it at all is documentation. Nobody writes down anything. When you are in the depth of a problem, even you will be able to collaborate with yourself better uh, later if you document it. So you can also collaborate with others, but you can also collaborate with the future if you uh, document. So that's another area of skill, engineering wise, that I would like to highlight of skills is that uh, we need we cannot create a hundred million jobs on engineering jobs alone sure right so you need those technical jobs so we need to um, technical as in the diploma holders and so on so we need to be able to skill that kind of workforce as well and uh, ITIs uh, are a great place uh, and the thought is fantastic we need to strengthen them we need to have corporates uh, augment them and sub uh, supplement them right so we need to create jobs of uh, those kinds carpenters electricians plumbers um, also people who can handle uh, mechanical engineering equipment people who can do uh, electronics work in uh, uh, factories and mm. so on and so forth so these are going to be the next level of uh, bulk jobs Sure, but then how do they prepare for these jobs given that there is an unknown factor called automation, right? So should the focus be purely on learning technical skills, right? As you mentioned, car painters, right? What, what if? So from an automation standpoint, uh, of course jobs will get impacted, uh, they will change. Yeah. Uh, but the areas that I'm talking about, uh, so a mechanical engineer mm. uh, or a mechanical technician or an electrician, or an electronics uh, person, those jobs actually will always be there. So uh, you might automate away a uh, factory worker uh, doing uh, you know, road tasks and you need to do that. Uh, but uh, the kind of 
person who will handle an equipment and program it for uh, smart work mm -hmm. um, will continue to be there. Can you automate it? Of course you can. But which will be cheaper to use uh, labor force to do that or to use AI to do every task? It will be easier to use AI for that. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, labor for yeah. that. Right? So we need to consider that jobs will continue. Automation sure. is not going to take away all jobs. Yeah. But then how do you think uh, those uh, 100 million jobs will be created? What is the way towards that? So like I mentioned, you need to look at uh, being at top of the value chain. So you need to uh, be global first in certain areas because then you can create a lot more jobs uh, further down. Secondly, you need to be the king of, let's say, AI, the, which means the source of the global workforce for AI comes from uh, India. Mm. But then you have to think about those technical jobs, technician jobs, uh, and create that bottom of the pyramid base uh, as well. So, but going backward from it, don't, uh, what about the education system of India, you know? What, what do you think can be improved there? I think number one would be to ensure that we are doing more hands-on stuff at the right level. Okay. Rote is required, rote is necessary. Uh, so until 10th grade, I think it is okay to be largely wrote, little hands-on, but from 11th and 12th grade onwards, especially uh, beyond that, mm. uh, it has to be significantly hands-on. Uh, you have to make people confident. So you need that industry participation, hands-on in the industry. So it's not just hands-on in lab, sure. but hands-on in the field. Mm. And then talking about Myron Foundry, then what is your hiring strategy? What do you look for and you know, what is the process there? Yeah, so we are a startup mm -hmm. and uh, we need a few good people. Yes. So today we are 20 and we'll remain 20 till uh, June of next year. Okay. Post that we'll grow again. Uh, probably will double in the few months after uh, uh, next year's uh, June. Mm -hmm. um, but the kind of people that we are looking for, like I described, are people who are curious and confident, people who can code, people who are hands-on, hands-on in the sense that uh, they are they're not uh, worried or uh, they do not fear uh, being able to get into the details and uh, figure out how uh, things work. Even the most challenging thing, so it might be easy to get something work on a laptop. But how do you get it to work on the Android? How do you get it to work uh, on a chip on your uh, mobile phone? So we need people who have that willingness to learn and the confidence to deliver. Sure. One other aspect that I wanted to ask you is that when a new startup comes up, what should that per that startup have in mind for its product? You know, should it be a global outlook or should it be specifically to India? I think each startup is different, mm -hmm. right? but I'll, if you ask me what does India need, mm -hmm. India needs more startups uh, which are looking to create global first uh, products. Okay. All of us will not be that, uh, but those of us who can aspire to be that should be that. Okay. And uh, is there in any way to do that? I mean, because we see a lot of companies coming out of China for like, you know, if you talk about specific software products, but not many coming from India. So the way to do that is um, find the biggest challenge hmm. uh, which uh, you are passionate about okay. um, and let me tell you my method, maybe that will help. Sure. So the way I look at it is what are the geopolitical trends, what are the consumer trends. So geo example of geopolitical trend uh, would be uh, let's say rural inclusion which hmm. is re uh, recent. Yeah. Right? Uh, rural inclusion uh, would mean that uh, can I create my product that it can reach the ru uh, rural population. So what does that translate into? Can I have OTT on low bandwidth, mm. right, uh, as an example? Yeah. Or uh, uh, consumer trends, for example, graying population, okay. or uh, women as buyers. Uh, these are uh, consumer uh, trends. Mm. Now from there, I move to what are the market needs, which are large, which, are, uh, which can be met differently today, or which are not yet articulated well enough that can be met in the future uh, with new technology. As an example, the move from diagnose and cure to predict and prevent. The move from detecting disease to detecting illness. Right? So this is the market requirement which you need to uh, both anticipate and uh, have an approach to being able to uh, solve. Right? And then you think about the technology that will be able to solve this. So uh, listening to cells for chronic inflammation to be able to move from diagnose and mm. cure to predict and prevent, hence becomes global first. Nobody in the world yeah. is doing this because chronic inflammation itself is very new as a science as it relates to wellness. So we are right there, we are leading the world, we will deliver the world's first product which can detect chronic inflammation non-invasively on a continuous basis and tell you early on whether you are moving away from wellness. Wow, really. 
I think we have had some really, really uh, great insights from you. I think it's been a pleasure having you here, and you know, really, really appreciate you coming here. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gobichan. Thanks. Good luck. So, oof.